Why don't you turn with me in your Bibles to then Ruth chapter 1. I said last week that um, we only got through half of the sermon. And so this week we are continuing in the same passage in Ruth chapter 1 verses 6 to 22. As we trace the, the lives of this family and God's incredible work of grace and redemption and providence in their lives. It really is a beautiful story, the story of Ruth. And it's a story, as I've said before, that many of us can relate to, um, can identify with, because some of us here, like Naomi and Ruth, were are foreigners. You're living in a country and in a culture that, that isn't your own. Um, that isn't truly home for you. Or like Naomi experienced, a number of you here today are widows and have, have lost your husband and know what it is to, to be on your own without your life companion. And yes, too, there are some here who have lost children, just as Naomi lost all her children, both her sons, in fact. And so, in many ways, this is a, a real story about a, a real family. And so, we can identify so richly with it. And as we saw in light of what Ruth faced last week, it was very much a circumstance which we can appreciate where her faith in God was tested. And so that is, that is the subject and the title for the message this week as well, as we began last week, is a tested faith. That life in this broken world is seldom very easy, or seldom turns out as we expect. And so though we saw last week, first of all, as we considered lessons of the Christian life, lessons of faith in this chapter of Ruth, we saw that firstly, a genuine faith, however, does always believe. A genuine faith cannot but believe, in spite of whatever circumstances you may be in. Always believes that God is sovereign. Always believes that God is good. And believes always that God is both those things always. That He is always sovereign. And perhaps more, more difficult, but no less true, that He is always good. And so yes, it's true, as we've seen in Ruth's life and, and as we've experienced in our own life, that, that God's providence in our lives is often mysterious, isn't it? That as John Piper writes, his providence is filled, however, with counterintuitive wonders. That God's work in our lives, therefore, does require faith. It requires faith because often it doesn't make sense to us, to our thinking, to our expectations, to, to our mindset, to, to our thoughts, to, to our paradigms. And so it requires faith. It's believing, in other words, when, when we cannot see, when it doesn't make sense. But ultimately, the very fact that there is so much mystery in God's working, it should result, as we trust God nonetheless, as we, as we live by faith, it should result in worship. It should lead our hearts to a deeper and greater appreciation of God who is that. He is God. And so He can work in ways that are beyond us, and that's okay. Because He is God, and I am not. And so I hope that as we continue through the book of Ruth, that whatever you're facing, as, as your faith is tested, you will hang on to that that essence of faith in God. 
and that far from your experience driving you further away from God, that it will in fact drive you deeper into God, that it will create fuller worship in your life. But having said that, as we've seen and we'll see again today in this chapter, that while faith can be genuine, our faith isn't always perfect, is it? We don't always respond the way we ought to. Sometimes our faith does waver. Sometimes we do struggle with our belief in God. And so secondly, what we're going to see today as we look at this chapter and, and learn about the Christian life and faith from Ruth, we're going to see that genuine faith sometimes struggles. That just because your faith is genuine doesn't mean that it will always be perfect. Can you relate to that? To not always having it together. To not always simply being at peace. To not always never being anxious. But genuine faith sometimes does struggle. Let's read about that in Naomi's life again. From verse 6 of chapter 1. So then Naomi arose with her daughters-in-law to return to the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and had given them food. Important to note that. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. So then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said still, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. And if I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Again, they lifted up their voices and wept. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And Naomi said to Ruth, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And may the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, No more. And so the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem, and when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And, and the woman said, Is this Naomi? And she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. So why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned. And Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Very significant. Now perhaps while last week we saw the reality of Naomi's genuine faith in the midst of her trial and what she still believed, Perhaps, though, what is most apparent about Naomi's faith in this passage is her struggle, is how she is wrestling here honestly and openly with God's ways and God's lot in her life. 
that despite her unshakable belief in God, nonetheless the, the loss and the hardship and the tragedy in her life has clearly tested her faith. You notice, as we even touched on last week, that three times in this passage, she expresses clearly how God's hand was what? Heavy. Heavy upon her. Pressing down on her. That while she was right, as we saw last week in acknowledging that God was behind all her circumstances in her life, even her bad circumstances, so that God was in control of the famine and of her move to Moab and of the death of her husband and of the death of her two, two sons and even of her being left to fend for herself in Moab, that God's hand was even behind all of that. But yet it was something that she struggled to immediately accept. While she acknowledged God's hand, it was something else to accept God's hand doing all that to her. In fact, so much so that she expresses how she feels, yeah, doesn't she? And what does she say about how she feels as a result of all of this? That she is bitter. That she is bitter. More so even, as we read in verse 13, exceedingly bitter. That she is really wrestling in her heart of hearts, really trying to reconcile all this pain and anguish and suffering in her life with the God that she knows is sovereign and good. And it's stirring her emotions, stirring her heart to bitterness, a deep emotion, a harsh emotion, an emotion that comes with a lot of other emotions that are negative, like anger and self-pity. But there she is, exceedingly bitter. In fact, she, she says again later in, in verse 20, again, how God has dealt very bitterly with her. So this is no isolated, momentary, passing feeling that she has. This is something that is with her for days and for weeks and even months. She is feeling this bitterness. Maybe you felt that at times in your life towards God when He hasn't played to the tune that you expected Him to play. And so, so much so that even the way she refers to God is acknowledging that God is acting in power against her by referring to God using the term Almighty, an expression of how God is the God of power and the God who acts as, as such against His enemies. That God has brought calamity upon her that she went away full and has come back empty. And so as Naomi wrestles with her faith, her faith, her faith she, she almost sees as if God is against her. She almost feels like, like she is enemy number one, that, that she's got a target on her back and all of God's arrows are aimed at her. And so she's upset. Yes, she feels like God is against her. That God has it in for her in light of her life and her circumstances. And I've no doubt that many of us here, if not all of us here, have felt the same way. And at one level, as we, as we read the, the reality of uh, Naomi's struggle here, with her faith and with God. Doesn't it just make the Bible and Christianity that much more plausible, that much more authentic? That, there, that there's no glossing over in the Bible as the people lived with God with faith. There's no walking on eggshells here and kind of avoiding talking about the bad stuff. There's no ignoring the elephant in the room. Naomi wears her heart on the sleeve. She, she expresses what she's feeling. She's saying she is bitter about 
her circumstances. Her faith, though genuine, is clearly not perfect. She is struggling. And that is the reality of the Christian life. If you've been a Christian for a year or even for six months, you may have picked that up. Certainly if you've been a Christian for, for 20 years or 50 years, you would have picked that up. In fact, isn't that what we read, not just in Ruth, but throughout the Bible? Perhaps even especially in a book like the Psalms. The reality of wrestling with who God is and with what life is like. Trying to reconcile the truth about God with our experience in life, when often they don't match. Yaku even read something of that for us this morning in Psalm 13, where the psalmist cries out, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? That is sometimes the reality of the Christian life. We feel like God has left us, like God has forgotten about us, that God is only with those people who seem to be prosperous and blessed. But those of us who are suffering and lacking, well, God has forgotten about us. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Psalm 10. Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Oh, the Bible is honest about the reality of faith. And you can't help but wonder if skeptics about the Bible and about Christianity would only read the Bible without any preconceived ideas. They will surely come to the conclusion that you cannot deny how true to life the Bible is. That so many other religions try and make try and make excuses for God. But the Bible doesn't. The Bible doesn't try and defend God. It just says, in the beginning, God. It just says, and the Lord's hand was heavy against me. No, the Bible is true because it is real amongst many other reasons. And so what we are saying is, is, yes, in a sense it is okay to be wrestling with your faith. Surely it mustn't lead you, though, to utter despair. Surely it mustn't lead you to apostasy. Yes, you've got to overcome bitterness, as Naomi had to come to overcome her bitterness, but there will be seasons when we struggle. We will, as Christians, stumble at times. In fact, Naomi's struggle is so deep that she almost feels like not simply God being against her, she feels that she is cursed by God. She feels that her life is now set in stone towards misery and towards bitterness and towards hopelessness. And that's really what comes out, and that's why the writer includes, I believe, this extended dialogue between her and her daughters-in-law about them going or staying with Naomi. Why we have such an extensive account of that is because what it reveals is Naomi's deep struggle and sense even of now being cursed by God. Because surely you've got to ask yourself, why was she so resistant to her daughters-in-law coming with her back home to Israel? I mean, shouldn't she have been delighted about that? I mean, she had lost her husband, she had lost her two sons, her only real family left are her, her daughters-in-law, albeit that they are Moabites, but still. And they are willing to come with her back home to even leave their pagan worship and and go back and join her with, with worshipping her God, and maybe even come to know her God. And yet she's determined for them to stay. That seems strange. That seems quite out of place. And what we see through this interaction is why that is so. Despite the fact that they are, are crying over the fact that they might have to depart, there is great weeping. I mean, clearly there is 
this unique relationship where, where the daughters-in-law love the mother-in-law. Often it's easier for son, sons-in-law to get along with the mother-in-law. It's a lot more difficult, right, for the daughters-in-law to get along with the mother-in-law. But yeah, the daughters-in-law love the mother-in-law. It's exceptional. But even so, Ruth is, I mean, Naomi is saying to them, no, stay. And it's because Naomi feels that if they stay with her, their lives, like hers, will become bitter, will become full of misery. It's as if she believes that with her, her bad move from Moab with her husband, that God is now punishing her. Punishing her to the extent that, that now she almost feels Naomi does responsible for the death of her two sons, which mean that now Orpah and Ruth are without husbands. That it's because of her sin, perhaps, that, that they've lost not only, that, that she had not only has lost her two sons, but they have lost their husbands. It's as if it's, it's her fault. And so if they continue to follow her, only bad things will happen to them. In fact, more than that, she acknowledges that she can't help them any further. She's too old to provide other sons for her. And if they go back to Israel, well, what chance do they have of finding a husband there in a foreign land? And so Ruth is adamant that they must stay. She's adamant that, that she is cursed. In fact, so much so that when Orpah, you realize, eventually concedes and gives in, and agrees to go back home and not continue with Naomi. Ruth digs her heels in even more. And Ruth is determined to stay with Naomi. And when she says to her, when, when Naomi says to, to Ruth that she should return, Ruth says no. But look at how Naomi expresses to Ruth in her desperation for Ruth to go, to go back home what she says. See, your sister-in-law, in verse 15, has gone back to her people and to her gods. And you've got to pause there for a moment and think, how can Naomi say that? How can Naomi be encouraging Ruth to go back to her gods? How can she be suggesting that Ruth go back to idolatry? It's perhaps almost as if she is saying, if you stick with me and my God, you've got no chance that perhaps your God will deal better and more favorably with you if you go back. Such is the extent of the strain that her faith is taking under her circumstances. Such is the extent of what she thinks that God has got it in for her and is against her. And don't we do that ourselves sometimes? Don't we sometimes feel that there is just nothing going right, right in our lives? That, that it's just one thing after another that seems to go wrong? We sometimes think, sure, other people have it so easy. Other people are so lucky. Look at what they've got. Look at all their money. Look at the cars they drive. Look at the house they live in. Look at the jobs they have. Look at the stuff that they're posting on, on Facebook and Instagram of what they're getting up to on the weekends. Wow, I wish I was them. It's like we lose our faith and we become superstitious, don't we? We, we begin to treat or view God like the pagans do that he's fickle, and that he's capricious, and that he's moody. We, we kind of almost think that God sometimes wakes up, even though he never sleeps and has a bad day, and he takes it out on us. So twisted sometimes, and deceived we can be in our faith. When life seems to be against us. And so is it true does God curse us? Is it true that for some of our lives, that's it? That's the lot? And that's what God has set out for us? 
and so help us God. Is it true that when one thing after another goes wrong, it means that our lives are doomed? That that's the direction and, that, and nothing's going to change that? Well, of course it's not true. God is not at all like that. Yes. Yes, God will discipline us for our sin. Yes, there are times when His hand will be heavy on us because of our sin. But that is only because He loves us. It is only because He's wanting to shape and mold us. That His expression of discipline and hardship in our lives isn't God saying He doesn't love us. Isn't God saying He isn't with us? It's the exact opposite. He's saying He is with us. And His hand is heavy, is heavy upon us because He does love us and because He knows what is best for us. And like a father who reaches and grabs a hand and, and pulls up his young son who's about to fall over the cliff, so God is reaching us and reaching us and jerking us out so that we don't find ourselves facing further disaster and harm. We are never God's enemies. Never. And, and nor can we either draw, let's get this right, a straight line always between our suffering and our sin. It doesn't mean that, that every hardship I'm facing, every, every crisis in my life is because directly of a particular sin I've done. No. That the other reality is that we live in a broken world. And so yes, we all do experience the effect of the curse in general, that this world is in bondage to decay and corruption. And so people die and people suffer and disease is real and unemployment is real. And we walk into sliding doors and bang our heads and, and break our noses. It happens. So we mustn't walk around thinking that this is a result of every sin in our lives that we are suffering. But let me say this as well. That if Naomi wasn't a Christian, then her view of life could very much be accurate. If Naomi wasn't a Christian, then actually, yes, her life is doomed. Her life is cursed. Her life is heading one way. That it is serious. That unless unless we repent of our sin and, and turn to faith in Jesus Christ, we are doomed. We are on a, a one-way path to hell. There's no other option for us. Unless we have decided to, to, to trust in Christ personally and wholeheartedly, there is no hope for us. And so, let's be clear this morning that there is no sitting on the fence when it comes to God and life. Some people think, I, I'm, 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 I'm not sure, you know, I'm sitting on the fence as if that's okay. Well, if you are sitting on the fence, the truth is that you're going to find out one day that that fence that you're sitting on is actually a gate, the gate into hell. There's not three ways of living life, there's only two ways. Either you're on the path to heaven or you are on the path to hell. You are cursed forever. Oh, but for those who, who are Christians, this is our hope because of what Jesus Christ has done. We are never cursed. Our lives are, are far from doomed. That we must not ever slip into the superstitious thinking about life and the world and God, which only brings bondage. Because as Christians, we are free. There is no condemnation. That Christ has paid it, hasn't He? He either has paid the curse or He hasn't. Either we're cursed or we're blessed, in other words. That's the status you're in. You're either a child of God and you are blessed. Spiritually. Forget about materially. Or you're cursed. But this is what Galatians, Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3. 
For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of, law, book of the law and do them. I mean, put up your hand if that applies to you. It applies to me. I certainly cannot keep the law perfectly. I certainly cannot obey God perfectly. I mean, that's all of us. Cursed, actually. But Christ has redeemed us from this curse of the law. How? By becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. And so there it was, 2,000 years ago on Calvary, as Christ hung on the tree, He did so as a sacrifice of atonement, as taking upon the curse which we deserve, namely the wrath of God in our place, that we might know the forgiveness of of grace and eternal life, that we might now live blessed of God, that we might now be set free from the curse of sin, no longer being enemies of God, but now being children of God. I mean, that is a truth that Naomi couldn't fully grasp or understand, but, but what we, this side of the cross, can, can't we? So let's get this superstitious nonsense out of our heads. You can never be cursed as a Christian. You can only be disciplined. And even when you're disciplined, you are blessed. Because as Paul says in Romans, if God has done all of this for us in Jesus Christ, and clearly then, if God is for us, who can be against us? Certainly not God. And as we saw last week, certainly though Satan is against us, he can do nothing to harm us beyond what God allows him to do to us. And so this morning, if you are bitter in your heart about your marriage, about your children, about your health, about your lack of wealth. Perhaps even about genuine tragedy in your life. Ask God to grant you the willingness and ability to repent and to trust Him and to believe afresh that He is sovereign and that He is good. Stop listening to the lies of the devil, because that is real. The devil loves it when we believe lies about God. That's his only weapon against us now as Christians, is to get us to believe that we are condemned, is to get us to believe that we are cursed. Ask God to shed the light of truth into your heart and into your mind, and set you free again with the truth of the gospel and what Jesus Christ has done. And so, yes, when our faith is tested, though genuine, it's not always perfect and it may waver. And then lastly, that in the end, it is not even though the strength of our faith that has the last say, it's not the strength of our faith, thank God, that finally determines the outcome of our lives. But rather it is God's purposes and God's power and God's providence that has the final say. So while genuine faith always believes that God is good and that God is sovereign, and while genuine faith, yes, sometimes struggles, lastly, we must never forget that even though our faith may be imperfect at times, it can never stop God and His plans and His purposes, which are always perfect. You see, as much as Naomi's hurt and pain and doubts had clouded her faith, 
Did it ever hinder God's purposes? Did it ever stop God doing what He ultimately wanted to do? Did it? No, it didn't. That God works, thankfully, praise His name, in spite of us. I mean, think about it as, as we've seen already, that Naomi should have been delighted that her daughters-in-law wanted to go back with her to Israel, to live with her, to, to support her, to, to stand by her, not least of all because of their mutual love for one another. But, but even as I hinted at, more so, she should have been delighted for, for the sake of their own spiritual well-being, that they could be taken out of this pagan country of Moab and be among God's people and there see the true God, Yahweh, work, get to hear about His ways and, and His law, and who knows, that they might truly come to follow Him as a result of being with her back home in Israel. I mean, what a gospel opportunity! And Naomi completely was blundering, completely missed it. Maybe you've done that a few times. Because of your wounded faith, you were blinded. To God's work. Well, what happened? <laughs> Did Ruth also give in and go back home? Did she? No, she didn't. She didn't. Remarkably, like almost inexplicably, she doesn't. Because there was nothing for her to gain by going with Naomi back to Israel, other than being with Naomi. As Naomi quite made quite clear in her interaction with um, her two daughters-in-law that, that there was nothing for her there. That in fact she had been, that Naomi, would, I mean Ruth would be following the same line of life that Naomi experienced. That Ruth would be going from being full to being empty. So according to human reason, she, she should have just said, okay, I will stay. I'll maybe pop in once a year and see you. But she doesn't, and Ruth responds with this incredible, famous affirmation of faith. Doesn't she? Where she says, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. That even where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Wow! I mean, can you believe that, that, that Ruth had such radical faith? You, you kind of ask yourself, where did it come from? It is extraordinary. It is under the circumstances. And so eventually after that, Naomi stopped putting up a fight. And so against all the odds, Ruth returns with Naomi back to Israel. And what happened as a result of Ruth going back to Israel? What in time became so significant about Ruth's persistence to join Naomi back in Israel? At the time, Ruth didn't realize the significance of her going back to Israel. That's for certain. Naomi certainly didn't realize the significance of Ruth's persistence to go back to Israel. But she ended up going back to Israel. Why? Because it was God's plan. Because God is sovereign. And because God is good. And nothing that we do, right or wrong, no matter how strong or weak our faith is, God still works in spite of us. And so it would so happen that Ruth ultimately would become as she gets married to Boaz later on in the story, through that, Ruth will become included in the ancestry of Jesus. And here is Naomi saying that, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. And yet she, through Ruth, would be included in the lineage of Jesus Christ, the Savior. I mean, that would have blown her mind and did when she got to heaven that God was doing all of that behind the scenes. That God was doing all of that. Naomi was so confused and, and bitter and blinded, but God wasn't. It seems she messed up God's plans, but she couldn't. 
And so while it doesn't excuse our foolishness or wayward faith, let's get this, that we can never mess up God's plans, what comfort and what assurance that is. And so therefore we don't have to be bitter or angry about our lives or our disappointments or complain during suffering or think I've blown it too much or that God is no longer interested in me. No, God is working out His purposes in everything and in every detail in our lives. That God has always got us. Even when He feels far from us. It's an incredible story of how God's purposes prevail and how God does exceedingly more than we could ever ask or imagine and even so it is incredible to see how in the midst of all of Naomi's struggle to believe and blindness God was still with her God was still providing for her it's incredible how the the, the narrator of this story and the author here begins and ends this passage by pointing us directly to God's providence that frames Naomi's life nonetheless, even before Ruth meets Boaz. That we are told that when she heard the news about the famine had ending in Israel, in verse 6, that where was Naomi? She was nowhere else than in the fields of Moab. Here she is without husband and without sons-in-laws in a foreign land, and what is happening? God is still providing for her. She is able to go to the fields of Moab and get food and glean. God hasn't abandoned her. God was still providing for her. And then it ends, you notice, by the writer making clear that they had returned from Moab and had come to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Noting how Ruth thinks she's come back empty, yet God is working all things, even the timing of the barley harvest, that she would arrive at the perfect opportunity when she could be provided for. Because again, without a man in her life in Israel, she would have been left to fend for herself. And as we know, Ruth would go out and glean and provide bountifully for her. Oh, in the midst of all of our hardship, in the midst of all of Naomi's hardship, God was still providing for her. She was not cursed. Yes, God's hand was heavy upon her, but God's other hand was also holding her and providing for her. Literally, as this chapter ends, we see that the winds are changing. We see a new season about to begin, though she cannot see it. That God is turning her life around. Little does she know how much. And so as we close, in light of all of this, what do we need to take home this morning? Well, I think we need to, first of all, not let bitterness blind us to the evidence of God's merciful purpose and provision in our lives. We've got to keep seeing who God is. John Piper writes that seeing is a precious gift. And bitterness is a powerful blindness. And that is true. Maybe God is calling you to return to Him today. Secondly, don't ever think that the sin of your past, don't ever think that the sin of your past means that there is no hope for your future. I mean, that sounds very like motivational but it's not it's because of the gospel and that we are no longer cursed but blessed and then lastly to remember that whatever is happening in your life God is always busy with a lot more than you realize a lot more than you realize and so I wonder I wonder if Naomi knew what God was doing. If if she knew what, what we know, if she knew that Ruth, through returning to Israel with her, marrying Boaz, would be included in the genealogy of Jesus. I, I wonder if, if Ruth, I mean, if Naomi knew that, that even though her husband died, 
even though her two sons died, and that they died without yet having had children, that still she would have a legacy through Ruth greater than she could have ever imagined. I wonder if, if, if she knew that her family history was far from over, as she thought. That God in His incredible sovereignty and grace was busy weaving her messed up life and circumstances into the lineage of Jesus, who would be the Savior of the world. I wonder if she knew all of that, would she have been bitter? Would she have been bitter? Of course not. And so the question is, what about us? What about you and I, who have been included on this side of the cross in Jesus' family and experienced personally His sovereign grace and mercy? You see, truly, the gospel should transform our response even when our faith is tested. Let us pray. Our God and Father, you know our hearts, you know our struggles, you know our sins, you know our failures. Fightings within and fears without. But our Lord, you are the God who is greater. And so we just trust you today to strengthen faith to renew faith, perhaps even for the first time to provide saving faith. And let us in our conversations in this week speak in such a way because of the truth of the gospel and of your hand at work in our lives, always, that we would find our words and our conversations seasoned with grace seasoned with providence, seasoned with the sure knowledge and acceptance that you are good and that you are sovereign. Thank you that you are with us in the mountaintop, or on the mountaintop, and that you are with us in the valley. May we cling to you, and may we run to you. And Lord, in the midst of these counterintuitive wonders of your providence in our lives, may we indeed worship you. For your glory's sake, amen.